The Le Mans is the world's oldest active sports car race, and the 1953 competition would go down as one of the wildest races in history. Not only is the race regarded as historic and as one leg of the triple crown of motorsport, it is also downright grueling, lasting an entire 24 hours. The winners of the 1953 Le Mans also happened to be running on zero hours of sleep, massive hangovers, and along the way one of them broke their nose while colliding with a bird at 150 miles per hour. Driving for Team Jaguar, Duncan Hamilton and Tony Rolt have just been informed that they've been disqualified from the upcoming race. After test driving the team's spare, Jaguar C-Type, during practice to assess a different axle ratio, the teammates found themselves disqualified after a protest from the rival Ferrari team. It appears that the two had practiced in a vehicle with the same number used by Jaguar team member Norman Dewis, number 18. Hamilton and Rolt were crushed, and they decided to deal with the news by having a few drinks. As a matter of fact, they got hammered. According to Hamilton's autobiography, Touch Wood, the two spent the night on the town, drowning their sorrows. Little did the pair know that Jaguar chief, Sir William Lyons, lodged a formal appeal against the penalty, and was awaiting a final decision from the race committee. and Rolt were nursing their hangovers over a pot of coffee when Lyons arrived in a hurry to tell his drivers the news. Peel had been approved, Lyons had paid the fine, and the pair was reinstated. They were to be starting the arduous 24-hour race in less than six hours. Hamilton and Rolt had yet to sleep from last night and became in dire need of a hangover cure. They ordered more black coffee and inquired if there was a Turkish bath in town. Settling for the next best thing, they went back to their chateau to take hot baths, listen to their wives, and drink more black coffee. By Hamilton's own account, around 2 p.m., they still felt dreadful. Now the truth of what follows next varies by who you ask. If you ask Jaguar team manager Lofty England or Tony Rolt, they would flat out deny the story and chalk it up to fiction. On the other hand, Duncan Hamilton was proud to embrace the story and covered it extensively in his autobiography. To Hamilton, it was a fitting anecdote for a man who lived a long and thrilling life. Hamilton claims that he knew he could not race feeling how he did, and knew that there was only one thing that could be done. He ordered himself and rolled double brandies, and claims to have felt immediately better. As the two made their way to the starting line for the 4pm start, it was determined that Rolt would kick off the race and Hamilton would close it off. Although the Jaguar team were considered one of the favorites, it seemed unlikely that the pair would fare well in an endurance competition that sees nearly 25% of the competitors fail to finish. With a total pool of 60 competitors, Rolt got off to a fairly decent start in 7th place. While Hamilton awaited his turn to tag in, he recalls sipping on another double brandy and enjoying the lovely day. By the fourth lap, Rolt jumped to fourth place and had managed a new lap record of 111 miles per hour. Shortly after 5 o'clock, he had pushed to second place and was trailing only Ferrari's Villarezzi. Rolt continued to press the Ferrari team and eventually overpassed for first place around 6 o'clock. Meanwhile, on the sideline, Hamilton apparently continued to work himself into race shape, but found that the coffee was giving him muscle spasms and shakes. He opted for another brandy, which seemed to do the trick. Now 7.10pm and more than 3 hours into the race, Rolt pulled in to refuel and pass the car off to Hamilton. As Hamilton may have expected, this would be the race of his life. James Duncan Hamilton was born April 30th, 1920 in Cork, Ireland. An amusing story from his autobiography hints how Hamilton always had an inkling for speed. When Hamilton was as young as two, he found a way to push himself forward in his pram. This ultimately resulted in Hamilton launching himself down a flight of 38 steps, knocking himself unconscious for hours on length.
Ireland during this period was in the midst of an ongoing conflict and had just concluded the Irish War of Independence. Hamilton recalls his family keeping their mattresses underneath their windows to avoid the sniper's bullets and his father's friend being shot on his doorstep. The family moved to West London when Hamilton was six, where he'd have a comfortable upbringing surrounded by a garage full of cars that his father seemed to change out every year. Based on his early recklessness while driving, his father suggested young Duncan to buy an old car that he could strip down and use as practice before he was to attend the Aeronautical Engineering College in Chelsea. While working on the car, he often carried parts up to his room to tinker and assemble the engine. After deciding the test started in his room, it sputted off his table and took down the first floor ceiling in the process. During his first test drive, he ended up putting the car through the garden wall onto the road, flipping the vehicle in the process and flinging himself yards from the scene. It would seem that Hamilton had forgotten to attach the brakes and nearly killed himself in the process. Hamilton graduated with a study in aeronautical engine repair and took an interest to hanging around the Brooklyn's Flying Club. His education and keenness for flying would play a major role in his decision to enlist in World War II at the age of 19, joining the Auxiliary Air Force. Hamilton's recklessness would catch up to him when he would eventually crash into the mess hall during a training exercise, demolishing the aircraft and building in the process. He would walk away relatively unharmed, but three days later was effectively released from the RAF with a written notice sent to his home. With war now breaking out, Hamilton opted to join the Navy and wrote a letter to the Admiral in charge of the expanding fleet air arm, giving details of his education and air engineering experience while deciding to leave out his time at the RAF. As he would put it, dumbfoundedly, he was appointed as an air engineer with a promise of transferring to full flying duties. Hamilton's time during the war was both exciting and blood chilling, as he found himself stationed in Norway on HMS Glorious. While down at the bar having a few pink gins, Hamilton found himself in a drunken argument with a senior officer over the best method for carrying coal. As Hamilton recalls, the two were interrupted by a massive explosion and the cutting of the ship's power. It would seem that the German battleships stationed nearby had fired at the ship, decimating it in the process. Hamilton's spot at the bar ironically put him in prime position to step off the sinking ship and onto a waiting lifeboat. Out of the ship's total crew of 1931, only 724 would survive. As Hamilton would put it, I remember thinking how strange it was that one man could walk out of the bar and into a lifeboat, whereas others perished. The sinking of HMS Glorious was a tragedy on its own, where over 900 souls were forced to await rescue in the rigid cold waters of the Norwegian Sea for three grueling days. To their horror, the attacking German battleships failed to pick up any survivors, under the impression that the nearby HMS Devonshire would collect their men. After what must have been three days of complete and utter horror, only 40 survivors were picked up by the Norwegian ships. It was later revealed that the naval investigation of the matter concluded that HMS Devonshire had in fact received the distress call, but chose to ignore the message. The investigation revealed that ship was carrying the Norwegian royal family back to Britain and used the sunken HMS Glorious as a smokescreen to provide safe passage. All logs of HMS Devonshire would be destroyed, but testimonies from those on board claim the message was received and willfully ignored. Meanwhile, Hamilton's wartime experience wouldn't get any quieter as he found himself on the bottom of another sinking ship in less than 24 hours. Hamilton was warming up in the steam room of HMS Curlew with a bottle of rum when the rescue ship came under fire from coastal German forces. Coincidentally aboard the ship, Hamilton ran into two old friends from his time at Brighton College, the Jackson brothers. While Hamilton would narrowly escape death with major leg injuries, his old friends would not be so lucky. Hamilton awoke at Hazler Hospital in England, where he would spend the next five months regaining the ability to walk. His first assignment after recovering was the 771 Squadron, responsible for communication and aircraft ferry duties. This appointment meant a continual stream of pilots passing through the offices, and Hamilton working beside several familiar faces. John Peter Wakefield was one of England's premier drivers before World War II. He was the winner of the 1939 Grand Prix of Naples and was posthumously awarded a BRDC Gold Star in 1948 by Prince Philip. Sir Ralph Richardson was one of the greatest English actors of the 20th century, with over 87 credits across film and television. And last, Laurence Olivier, one of the most prolific English actors of all time. Hamilton spent the rest of the war assisting with Allied espionage efforts to collect agents stuck behind enemy lines. 
He would continue to rack up close calls, including an incident where he crashed a Bentley through a brick wall in Holland. Hamilton came home from the war to find that both of his parents had passed, and soon decided to marry his girlfriend Angela. She pleaded with him to take up a safe desk job, but the excitement of racing was far more enticing. By the late 1940s, Hamilton had begun to establish a name for himself on the circuit. During Duncan's time on the circuit in early 1950, he recalls meeting fellow World War II veteran and British driver Tony Rolt. Initially competing against each other, the two found kinship for their shared love of racing and their larger-than-life personalities. Hamilton warmly recalls the first words Rolt and him exchanged after they raced together. The object is to get around quickly, not to kill yourself. As early as 1950, Hamilton competed in the Le Mans with Rolt as his teammate, then driving in a Nash Healy. The pair would finish 4th and 6th before making the switch to Jaguar in 1952. Rolt's story was incredible in its own right, and his resilience shown in endurance racing was something that didn't manifest overnight. Before World War II, Rolt had already made a name for himself as a talented driver, competing in the 24 Hours of Spa as early as 1936. Rolt was forced to compete in Belgium, as his British driving license was revoked at the time due to excessive speeding. Rolt entered the Royal Military College in 1939 and received a commission for the Rifle Brigade. As a lieutenant, he was in charge of a reconnaissance platoon and found himself thrown into the Battle for Calais, responsible for delaying German forces before their attack on Dunkirk. He would earn a military cross for his acts of bravery, saving a wounded comrade from the advancing German troops. It would be some time before Rolt was able to receive the honor, as he would spend the next four years captured as a German prisoner of war. Rolt's time as a prisoner deserves a Hollywood film in its own right, as he would manage seven escape attempts from German prisoner of war camps and eventually end up at the maximum security prison Oflag 4C, known as Kolditz Castle. Kolditz held several high-profile prisoners, including British actor Desmond Llewellyn, who would play Q in 17 James Bond films. His attempts were as creative as they were courageous. Using false documents, he made it within 100 meters of the Swiss border before being intercepted by German forces. During another attempt, he walked out of the camp's main gate dressed as the Swiss Red Cross, evading forces for two days before ultimately getting caught again on a train. Once imprisoned at Kolditz Castle, he was the mastermind behind one of the most ingenious plans of prison escape, now referred to as the Kolditz Glider. Rolt noticed that the chapel roof line was completely protected from German view, and that theoretically, if you could launch a plane from the roof, it would have a clear path across River Mold. Gaining expertise from a book in the prison library, Aircraft Design, inmates Bill Goldfinch and Jack Best began to build a glider in the lower attic of the chapel. Using stolen wood, prison sleeping bags, and rationed millet, a crew of 12 prisoners assembled a glider that was 32 feet wide and 20 feet long, nose to tail. The glider was to be launched using a 60-foot runway constructed out of tables and a pulley system devised out of a bathtub filled with concrete. The plan was ultimately never completed as it became clear that any escape plan would put the rest of the inmate population at risk for mass executions. Additionally, prisoners could hear the sound of allied forces in the distance and sensed the end of war was near. What Rolt brought to the partnership was the undeniable ability to adapt and persevere. It didn't hurt that he was a very talented driver in his own right, and was responsible for pushing the team out to an early lead around 6pm. The participants of the 1953 Le Mans competition were a talented field of drivers that included 60 participants across 19 different makes. Notable names included the current three F1 world champions to date, and over 30 up-and-coming Grand Prix racers. By the time Hamilton took over for Rolt around three hours in, it would appear that the Jaguar Type C's disc brakes, then a first for the competition, gave the pair a noticeable boost. While other cars could theoretically reach higher speeds, the Type C's braking system afforded the ability to maintain higher speeds around corners and vents, an unprecedented advantage for endurance racing. While Hamilton roared across the Malsane Strait at 150 miles per hour, an unlucky bird crossed the vehicle's path and smashed the windshield of the Type C, breaking his nose in the process. Now with over 16 hours remaining in the competition, the pair would have to complete the race with a smashed windshield, with the only spot of wind protection reachable by crooking your neck to the left. At the halfway point of the race, Hamilton and Rolt had led the field with 152 laps. 
about 2,050 kilometers covered, with the Ferrari car trailing in second at 150 laps. Hamilton pulled in at 5.30 a.m. to eat a very good breakfast and enjoy a coffee and cognac, still yet to have slept. As he would quote in his book, no one sleeps at Le Mans when your car is still on the track. In fact, the contest was notorious for pushing drivers to their physical and mental limits. Just a year before, a French driver, Pierre Levy, attempted to complete the entire race without passing off the controls to his teammate. He made it 23 hours in before he accidentally switched to the first gear, blowing his engine. Pierre finished the 1953 event in 8th place, but would happen to be at the center of the horrific crash at Le Mans only two years later. Pierre's car was launched into the grandstand, taking the lives of himself and 84 spectators, while injuring over 100 others. Although Hamilton was still leading the race by 6.30 a.m., it was hard to maintain high spirits as the lap keepers had announced that Ferrari driver Tom Cole had gone missing. It was later determined that the British-born driver had collided with the bank when overpassing another car and was propelled through a wooden hut, killing him instantly. By the time that 2 p.m. came, the team of Hamilton and Rolt had managed to cover 278 laps, already one more than last year's competition. By 3.30 p.m., the scoreboard had ran out of numbers. After 24 hours of continuous racing, the checkered flag was finally raised. Hamilton and Rolt completed 304 laps, amassing to a whopping 4,088 kilometers. Out of 60 starting competitors, only 26 would actually finish. Reuniting with their wives at the finish line, the pair were welcomed with a standing ovation. It would seem that 48 hours of no sleep and a broken nose was not enough to keep Hamilton from persevering. As Duncan would say himself, it is amazing what good cognac and the will to achieve an ambition can accomplish. Pierre's adventures at Le Mans would continue for another two years, where they would finish second and after a blown gasket, a do not finish. Rolt ultimately decided to retire from the sport that year, following LeVay's tragic crash. Hamilton would continue to race until his retirement in 1959 and collect incredible close calls along the way. The most notorious being immediately following his 1953 Le Mans win, where he took out the power of El Porto, Portugal when he crashed into an electrical pylon. Hamilton was forced to sit through a surgery without anesthetic or fresh water, supplementing the two for port wine. In his retirement, Hamilton used his company Duncan Hamilton & Co. Limited to begin buying and selling historic cars. His son Adrian would follow his father and become a renowned car dealer in the UK. Adrian's son Archie is a current British driver that happened to qualify for the historic Le Mans in 2013 at the age of 21. Adrian Hamilton, Duncan's son, would divulge a detail that seemed to find the thread of truth in Duncan's hangover tale at Le Mans. Hamilton and Rolt's night out was in fact Thursday, but they did not compete until the Saturday, likely giving the two some time to cool their hangovers. The truth of what happened probably lies somewhere in the middle, as Adrian would be the first to admit that his father could certainly handle the wheel after a few drinks. 